Kia ora. Welcome to this message from Hope Chapel Hamilton. We hope that this message inspires you and we pray that it brings you encouragement wherever you are in life. I'm Steve Hurst. Who doesn't know me? Anyone here doesn't know me? One or two of you? Well, God bless you. I'm Steve Hurst and as Stuart said, my wife and I started this church off in uh, 1996, however long that was, what's that? 23 years ago and handed the church over to Pastor Joel and Sarah three years ago. And we love what they've done with the place. And we're still part of the congregation here, now in support, not leading it. So living under an open heaven, <clears throat> what do you imagine living under an open heaven would be like? What is it? Does that conjure up any uh, visualisations for you? What, who, who do you think did live under an open heaven? Jesus, you reckon? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the disciples, the apostles. So when they, they received the Holy Spirit, they went out, planted churches across the world, changed the world because they carried what Jesus carried. They carried the presence and power of the Holy Ghost with them and they did the stuff. So they lived under an open heaven, if we can use that term. Yeah, is that true? So maybe, what about today? Uh, Pastor Bill Johnson, uh, Pastor Phil Pringle, Pastors uh, Joel and Sarah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, what I'm trying to do this morning, my, my task, I reckon, by the Holy Spirit is to, is to try and get all of us to understand. I'm laying some foundations now for how everybody gets to, this is not just for the BMOGs, Big men of God. This is for everyone. Yeah. So, so if I lay a foundation where, so first of all, what's important is that you get it. Because when you get it, when you grasp this, then you're able to form a church with a bunch of other people who grasp this. And suddenly there's this open heaven over your life and over a whole congregation. And suddenly you become like those New Testament churches, which go out and plant and change the atmosphere of the environment. And it's not just BMOGs, it's us. Turn to someone and say, this is you, BMOG. <laughs> so so how, would you, how would I describe an open heaven? I would describe it as no impediment between a person and God. It's a free flow of anointing when you need it sense of a Spirit's presence when you need it. Now I say when you need it, because it's like, I just, wanna, I just wanna put to bed some silly ideas that people have. Being, living under an open heaven, being filled with the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean you walk around like this. That's weird. Living under an open heaven means you're just filled with the Holy Spirit. And you just, you go and you do your job and you interact with life as you do. And then some opportunity presents itself and you just thank God for the infilling of the Holy Spirit and you minister like Jesus did. You carry this with you. It's not something weird or special or only, a, only Neville carries this. It's everybody can carry this. In fact, it's the will of God that you do. So no impediment between you and God. So let me set the scene so we can get a grasp of how any Christian can get to live under an open heaven. I want to lay the foundation, set the scene. So let me take you back to when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. When, when that happened, when He died, a, a couple of, a series actually of spectacular events happened and they're mentioned almost casually in the Scripture. So casually, you could almost overlook it, not even notice it, but... They're astounding things. I'm just going to touch on, on two of them in, in uh, Matthew 27, 50 and 51. And it says this, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, He gave up His Spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You've read that. Now, let me just go to the first part. Jesus cried out in a loud voice. I just want to, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when a person is close to death, some traumas happen to their body or, or they're about to expire, they don't make loud noises. It, it's like um, their voice is weakened by their struggles and barely audible. The loud voice of Jesus 
shows that in spite of the pain and suffering he'd endured for the previous 18 hours or so, his life was whole in him and his nature was still strong. He spoke like a man in his full strength to show that his life was not forced from him. His, his spirit didn't depart his body in a kind of a little whimper. His spirit departed his body when he gave it up. He spoke in a loud voice and then it says he gave up his spirit to the Father. Voluntarily, he laid down his life for, our, for the sheep. He didn't get squashed for the sheep. Do you get it? He's strong. So, so what was it he shouted? Well, according to John 19.30, his last words were, it is finished. Now I said that real quiet because I didn't want to disturb the, any babies here. But Jesus didn't say it quiet. He shouted this from the cross. His last words, after all the suffering, after all the prophetic things had been fulfilled in his life, his last word, all the three hours of darkness over the, over the entire planet, his last words were when, he, when he'd taken all the sin of all the world upon himself on the cross, his last words were, yes, it's finished. Then he gave up his spirit to God and died. And the Roman soldier goes, far out, that must have been the Son of God. Then some clown with a spear comes up and pierces his side to see if he was uh, too late, sucker, he's gone. Jesus controlled the moment of his death and he did it with style and panache. (laughs) Yeah. So what was finished? The prophet Daniel prophesied this exact moment some hundreds of years earlier in Daniel 9.24. Now follow this, should be up on the board, there it is. So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish the transgression, here's what what the prophecy is saying. This is what's gonna happen for your people and, and your holy city. To finish the transgressions in this time, in this period of time, at the end of that, God's going to finish the transgressions, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. So Daniel's got this prophetic word. He's going, wow, that's in all these hundreds of years time. Write it down, write it down. And then all these hundreds of years later, Jesus expires on the cross, totally in control of when He bears the sins of the world and, and gives up His Spirit. Then book of Hebrews 10.14 10.14 kind of dovetails in to this prophetic word from Daniel. Have a look in Hebrews 10.14. There it is. For by one sacrifice, I can see it there, He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice, He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So who? He's made perfect forever who? Us. And And He is in the process of making you holy. So by the one sacrifice, immediately when you receive Jesus, seriously take Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, and it's like a whole heart commitment. At that moment, your your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as far as God is concerned, you're perfect now. And then little by little, as you you go... (laughs) Perfect? I don't think so. And you know, you talk to your wife or your husband or your friend and go, yeah, you. In the eyes of God, you're made perfect and is in the process of making you holy. How does that happen? I, I, I know how it happens in my life. That whole months go by and then suddenly, it's like the Lord, I do something, say something, have some attitude, whatever. Lord just puts His finger on that. That can get really annoying. And I said, like, wow, wow, it's time to stop. That, that bit now, it's got to go. And I, go, I either go, yes, Lord, or I go, no, go away. And if I go, go away, he just goes, it's so annoying. And eventually I go, yes, Lord. And that little bit extra holiness comes onto your life as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. By one sacrifice, He made you perfect forever. He put away iniquities, Daniel said, finished the transgressions, finished your, He made an end of your sins, made a reconciliation for your iniquities. He brought in everlasting righteousness. He made perfect for everlasting. Wow. So 
And, and just to put the icing on the cake, Jesus gave up His Spirit at the exact time of the offering of the evening sacrifice celebrated by the Jews. Just to really tee it all up with the Old Testament prophecy and so on. The second thing to take out of that Matthew 29 passage, it says this, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That was a very thick piece of material. Nobody's gonna tear that material. And, and it cut off the Holy of Holies from us sinful people. Only the high priest could go past that veil and it was once a year and he had to have a very particular thing. He took in a blood of an innocent animal, sprinkled the, the, the altar, sprinkled the surroundings with that blood and it was done to bring forgiveness for the people of Israel. Israel's sins were forgiven and God says, all right, you're forgiven. Do it again in a year's time because you'll need to. Hebrews 10 talks about that. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offering? Wouldn't they, be, wouldn't they stop being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. When Jesus cried out in that strong voice, it is finished the veil of the temple ripped from God's end down to our end. The separation between holy God and sinful humans came to an abrupt end. Jesus perfectly fulfilled all that the law demands of you on your behalf. In fact, if you want a more succinct definition of the gospel of what Jesus did, write this down because this is a good one. This is solid gold, man. This comes from 40 years of experience, you know. This, this is a pearl of great price. You ready for this? Here's what Jesus did. Jesus lived a perfect life. Is that true? And He put your name on it. First thing you think, no, that can't be right. No, I know what I'm like. So does God. That's why Jesus died for you. Part of our, our current series, is they, they, in terms of our current series, when you receive Jesus, when you truly open your heart and, and truly repent, receive Christ, it, it's, like a, it's like marriage. It's like, oh God, I want you. I know, I've, I've decided I want to follow Jesus all the days of my life. I don't want anything. I don't want to live without you any longer. When you receive Jesus sincerely, wholeheartedly, you begin a life lived under an open heaven. Whether you know it or not is another matter. That's what I'm here to talk about. The reason why this series is so necessary is lots of Christians do not know how to live under an open heaven. Don't know how to make that their own. Many Christians live suboptimal lives due to just one thing, lack of knowledge. Prophet Hosea said this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The remedy is twofold. It's two, just two things. One is knowing the truth. Second thing is learning to believe the truth. Know the truth, learn to believe it. Know the truth, accept it. Know the truth, live like it's true. Just two things, just twofold. If your foundations are good, this is foundational stuff. If your foundations are good, your house will stand. So first, know the truth. Jesus provided for us to live under an open heaven and that starts with accepting who you are in Christ. If you don't accept it, I mean, so you read it, you hear it and you accept it. How many, no, you can read stuff for years and it kind of gets to here, but your heart doesn't get it. You go, you know, you've got all this, I doubt it, I don't think so stuff going on and you think of other people who, who are worthy of this sort of stuff, but you, not me, and ask your wife, she goes, no, not you. So, but, but the truth is when, it gets, when you accept it and you start to talk it and believe it, you start to walk under an open heaven, which is your right. So here's, here's who you are in Christ. This is foundational truth. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone 
is in Christ. Is there anyone here this morning in Christ? Would you lift your hands for me if you're in Christ? A finger will do. <laughs> Are you in Christ? All right, so anyone, this is you. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come already. The old is gone and the new is here. The old is, your old self is gone and the new is here. If you're in Christ, do you believe it? <laughs> Second scripture I wanna give to you, just the two. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, just a couple of verses further down. God made Him who had no sin. Do you believe Jesus had no sin? People came to accuse Him and He said, for what sin do you accuse? And they dropped their stones. God made Him who had no sin to be sin. To be. All of the sin of all of the world from all history, past, present, future, was bundled up into a horrible, heaving, massive garbage and laid on Jesus on the cross. That's why the Father turned His head from Jesus. Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? He knew why. God, holy God can't look upon sin. Jesus became that for us. He took all the garbage out of your life and your thinking. He took it all on the cross so that what? In Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. He took all of that stuff out of your life and now He declares you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you believe it? I can feel a yibbits. I can feel a whole hunch of yibbits, a whole bunch of yibbits coming at me. Yibbit, 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 I do that. Yibbit, I, yibbit, I, I yib. Why don't you have a barbecue this afternoon, fire up the barbie, take all your yibbits and stick them on the coals. And why don't you start to believe? Here's the deal. It's knowing the truth and it's accepting the truth. You want to live under an open heaven? Know the truth and accept it means it's for you. I, I, a psychotherapist friend of mine once put it this, time, this way to me. He said, Steve, sometimes people have to accept the truth above even their own conclusions. Sometimes people have to take the truth on board, even if it clashes with their culture. Even if it clashes with your upbringing, with the things you've been taught and, and things you've taken on and imbibed over the years from school teachers and friends and all, all, all that stuff, if it clashes with the truth, you have a decision to make. Are you going to accept the truth, scriptural truth, or are you going to live by this stuff? That's, that's, that's how simple this is. I wish it was harder. I wish I could really have a degree in this and, and you know, be called Dr. Hurst. That'd be cool because I've got a doctorate in this stuff. But it's so simple. Are you going to accept it? This is all foundational because, you know, I'm just laying foundations here. Side with the truth against yourself. That's the second thing. Learn to believe right. Because here's the deal. In, Matthew, in Mark 16, verse 17, Jesus said, these signs shall follow those who believe. Now, I want to just flip that on its head and, and tell you that this is, this is real, man. This is real life. Signs of what you believe come off your life all the time. Whatever you believe, actually, in your heart is what comes off you. So I remember um, before I understood this stuff, before I got it, I would be, you know, I'm sort of, I must be a magnet for trouble. And so people would come up to me, troubled people would come up to me and say, oh, Steve, how are you going? You know, because it's polite to ask how you're going first. You know, how are you going? I said, good. Would you pray for me? And, and I would say, okay. And, and so they'd say, you know, tell me what was wrong in your life or what was ailing them. And, and here's the thing, because I didn't believe this was true of me. 
So what I used to think I had to work to get God's favour. I had to work to do so. I had to, so i would be thinking, back in my mind, I'd be going, oh, I didn't pray enough. I haven't prayed enough today. Or I haven't fasted. Or I haven't read enough Scripture. So all these stuff I hadn't done. And I, so I can do English or right, I can speak. You know, so I'd concoct a really flowery prayer. It was awesome, man. Shakespeare would be jealous. You know, and I'd be doing it. Great prayer. And, and nothing happened. Because it's just words from an empty vessel. Don't lift your hand, but anybody here like that? That's what happens when you don't believe the truth and you don't let the truth mould you. Everyone believes something, just the way we're, we're wired. So if you believe you're not quite there yet, if you believe you're not quite good enough, you believe you're not worthy, if you believe you have insufficient faith, if you believe God has favourites and you're not one of them, all of these beliefs will hold you back. Actually, my daughter gave me this beautiful piece of uh, A4 shaped paper with, with uh, uh, you know, laminated and it was, uh, God loves everyone, but I'm His favourite. Uh, thank you, Natalie. God bless you, darling. <laughs> I'm His favourite. You're all his favourite. Do you believe it? <laughs> all these beliefs, all these false beliefs will hold you back. They prevent you walking under an open heaven. You can pray all you like for an open heaven. Knock yourself out. Pray long, pray short, pray all you like for an open heaven. If you don't believe the truth, you'll get nothing. Very quiet in this Anglican church. It's simply about knowing the truth and believing the truth. The bottom line is you will get what you believe for. So the cross, the cross is the dividing line, the dividing emblem between the Old Testament and the New Testament. On one side of the cross, you live under the law and a, and a closed heaven. On the other side of the cross, you live under grace and an open heaven. I want to just talk about that for a minute. You've got to choose which side of the cross you want to live from. So on the Old Testament side of the cross, God's grace is undeserved. On, on, beg your pardon, on the New Testament side of the cross, God's grace is undeserved, unmerited, unearned. On the Old Testament side of the cross, the law is all about deserved favour. So when we obey the law perfectly, Deuteronomy says, we'll be blessed. But as, as we know, no one obeys the law perfectly. No one does. Put up your hand if you've obeyed the law of God perfectly this week. No liars in the house. Awesome. That's great. No one can live the law perfectly. So you can't be blessed under the Old Testament law. On the New Testament side of the cross, we're not fighting for victory. That's an Old Testament phenomenon. On the Old Testament, you had to fight for victory. On the New Testament side of the cross, we fight from victory. Jesus won the victory already. We just fight in the, in the light of what Jesus achieved already. When people, I've had a demonised person brought to me and uh, I didn't go, oh, demons, oh God, what do I do now? Oh, let me fast and pray. Hang on, I'll come back in three months. That'll, that should do it, three months, intensity. No, I just go, Jesus beat the devil on the cross. Boom, get out and it left. Seriously, it was easy peasy. And I like to take the credit and say, oh, you've got a mighty man of God here, man. You know, you just, no, I'm just a New Testament believer. I believe this. On the wrong side of the cross, we're orphans. On the right side of the cross, we're sons and daughters and partakers of the divine nature. On the Old Testament side of the cross, people pray, God, would you heal this person? But on this side of the cross, God gives us authority and anointing to intervene on people's lives. To heal the sick. On the oh, it's Christians, a lot of Christians struggle to be righteous. They struggle. But when on the right side of the cross, when I'm living on the right side of the cross, I already am the righteousness of God. It's my right. God looks down on Steve Hurst and goes, Oh, look, there's a blood washed boy. He's my son, washed in the blood, cleansed. He's perfect. 
my wife was here before and she went, amen, in the first service. My husband, perfect. You believe that, Natalie? Thank you, darling. My daughter knows too. They agree with God. Stephen's perfect. Why? Because I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've received Christ. So I'm perfect. You want to be perfect like me? (laughs) Just receive the Lord and then start to believe the truth. That's all. It's so easy. So it's not about right doing. It's about right standing. When you believe this, you step into an open heaven. On the Old Testament side, you had to do things to be forgiven. In the New Testament, the demand is no longer on you, it's on Christ. Now, now people say, yeah, but what if I sin? What if I do something wrong? Okay, so what did Jesus teach us? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Forgive me my trespasses. I, I forgive those who trespass against me. So pray that prayer and then get on with it. Yeah, because you're forgiven. It's very quiet in this church this morning, Stu, isn't it? This is just so deep, man. People are just going, oh, amazing. That's true, eh? <laughs> Romans 3, 23 to 25 says this, for everyone has sinned. Look at the person next to you say, yeah, that's you. <laughs> that's definitely you. And we've all, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Turn to the other person, the other side now, otherwise they'll feel persecuted if you tell them twice. So you've fallen short. You've fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. Wow. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. It's Romans 3, 23 to 25. So on the wrong side of the cross, I'm sin conscious. On the right side of the cross, under the open heaven because of what I believe, I'm God conscious. From this side of the cross, I can fight the battle from victory, right? Because Jesus won it. Which side of the cross do you want to live on? When I'm Jesus conscious, I feel free to live a supernatural life. A lot of, man, I better pull this to a conclusion. Time is racing on. So, On the wrong side of the cross, God is sometimes angry with me. Yeah? On the right side of the cross, I live under God's smile. Where do you want to live? On the wrong side of the cross, sometimes God makes me poor to humble me. But over on this side of the cross, God is my provision. I tell you, just recently, uh, about within the last 12 months, I've just, I've always been a tither and, um, in the, within the last 12 months, I just started right out of the blue. God just started to niggle me about tithing. And I, I started to get unsatisfied about my tithing. And I don't know why. I was like, well, I've always tithed. What's the deal? And so I'm, I'm kind of wrestling this through with God, praying, asking for some wisdom. And, and um, it felt to me like God was challenging me to go beyond the tithe. So first of all, I was getting challenged about the tithe. So my first carnal thought was, Am I off the hook? Because I'm retired now, you know, I'm a pensioner. So can I stop tithing? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and God's going, no, 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 no. I want you to go beyond. I go, Whoo. And so he gave me a figure. I talked to my wife about it. She went, yes. And so we started giving this figure and I feel like it's in a faith step. It's an obedience step. On this side, it's all about law and about obligation, what you ought to do. And if you don't do it, you're gonna come under God's curse, all that stuff. But I live on this side of the cross where Jesus is my provision. So if Jesus gives me a clue to step it up a little bit, exercise faith, I feel good. Hey, you see it? You get it? So you all need to double your tires immediately. <laughs> Just kidding. On this side of the cross, God sometimes makes me sick to teach me a lesson. Blah, horrible theology. On this side of the cross, my God heals me. On that side of the cross, 
Ah, forget it. Jesus paid the price and said, it is finished. Do you think God's mad at you? Sometimes, some people say, yes, when I do something wrong. Well, Romans 3.20 says, for no one can ever be made right, made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And then in the next couple of verses, Romans 3, 21, 22, He says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. You're off the hook. Doesn't mean you can steal from people, but you know, when you do something wrong, you're off the hook because Jesus, oh, read on Stephen. As was prof- promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for preachers, MLT members, connect group leaders. This is true for everyone who what? Oh, that's so easy. But it's the truth. Side with the truth. Do you get it? On the Old Testament side of the cross, we're punishable. On the New Testament side, we're unpunishable. We live under an open heaven. Now, The power to live under an open heaven, I'll just conclude with this thought, is actually, it's in your hands. It's that simple. It's it's, if you believe the truths I've told you today, you may step into an open heaven. It changes everything. It changes everything. Everything. It's like you become a soldier. And you've done basic training, you know how to shoot, you know how to march, you know how to conquer territory. It's like that. It's like you become, you're this bunny and now suddenly you become the soldier, fully equipped. And when you walk into town with your gun, it's like the devil takes notice. And you become the soldier, you become this person who just, you can hear from heaven, you get inspiration because you're not always over here always thinking, what do I, do to, what do I have to do to get inspiration? You, if, if, oh, it's a big subject, but anyway, just take it from, take it from me. You, you move here and it's like, God, speak to me. I have an open heaven. If I need some inspiration, you'll give me inspiration. If I need a clue, you'll give me a clue. I'm open, speak to me, Lord. Prayer is good. This is all foundation. Prayer is good if you wanna hear from heaven or, or reveal your needs to God in prayer. That's all good. But now you're fully equipped. If you believe these simple truths, you become a fully equipped person. You become this person that's dangerous to the devil. You become this person that can hear from heaven and grow in confidence. You become this person that people can watch. Oh, Steve, can you pray for me? You go, yep. What ails you, man? Come here. Do you want to live under an open heaven? Do you? There's a 12 week course starting tonight. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just listen, just believe this. So here, <laughs> I felt this collective inrush of breath almost suck me off the platform. <gasps> weeks why don't you stand with me and we'll just pray thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord I'm, we're just going to pray Pastor Joel has asked us to pray for ourselves and for the church for a kickoff. so the prayer for ourselves we're going to do an exercise of speaking the truth over our lives we're going to speak the truth over our lives right you with me I'll lead you in those scriptures 2 Corinthians 5 17 So let me lead you and you you close your eyes and pray this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Oh, that's very quiet. The old is gone. The new is here. That's me. A little louder, please. That's me. (laughs) A few verses down, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for me so that in Him I might become the righteousness of God. That's me, Lord. I am the righteousness of God. In the eyes of God, I'm righteous. I am pure. I'm being made holy. Oh, thank You, Father.
Father. Thank You, Father. Now, Lord, I pray, let Your truth sink into every heart here this morning. Lord, that it migrate from the head where we're giving mental assent down to the heart where it changes us, where we grasp it, where, where we live a different life, where we're like a soldier, fully armed, fully equipped, fully trained, dangerous to the devil, just like the early disciples were. Oh God, let it sink into our hearts afresh in Jesus' Name. Thanks for joining us for this message. For more information about our church, head along to www.hopechapel.nz. See you next time.